So today we're going to talk a little bit about the PPO and the MACD. Uh, both of these are momentum oscillators. They're really almost identical. I'm going to explain the difference, but it's a pretty subtle difference between the two. Uh, you probably, when you look to see, uh, when you look at them on a chart, you're probably not going to see uh, much difference in the way that the oscillators uh, appear. So let's take a look at first the definition. And I would suggest anytime you are looking to learn about a new um, indicator, start with chart school. Uh, the best, you know, I would rather chart with, uh, start with chart school rather than start with my portfolio balance and try to start trading off of an indicator that you don't understand very well. I think the real key, whatever indicators you use, you really should understand uh, what makes them tick and uh, how they're calculated and why they work, why they don't work, what their limitations are and so forth. So I had written an article, this was probably about three years ago about uh, trading secrets, MACD trading secrets. And it was probably one of the most popular articles I wrote. So I thought it would be a good time. I know there were a couple of comments that came in talking about the MACD and the PPO and uh, whether I could do something to talk about that. So I went back to this uh, MACD trading secrets article that I had written a few years back and uh, we're just going to kind of bring them back, some of the, the topics that I discussed. But before I get into it, I want you to just to take a look at the difference between the MACD, which is the Moving Average Convergence Divergence, and the PPO. Uh, so the easiest way to, to explain it is to put it all on one chart. So this top panel up here you'll see is the MACD. Uh, next up is the PPO. And then I've got a price chart. Now, normally what I have is a 20, 50 day and sometimes a 200 day moving average, but I changed it. And if you look down below here, I've actually set up my exponential moving averages for 12 and 26 periods because that is the default that's used for calculations of both the MACD and the PPO. So when you come back up here and you look at the 12 and 26 period, of course, this is a daily chart. So it's the 12 day and the 26 day exponential moving average. The difference between these two moving averages, in this case, this is Micron technology, the difference is 2.25. The 12-day EMA for Micron is at 59.56. The 26-day EMA is at 57.31. So the 12-day is $2.25 higher than the 26-day EMA. Now, when you look at the MACD, 2.25, you see that calculation right there? it's telling you that the MACD calculation is 2.25. And I just showed you how you can put it on your chart so that you can make sure you understand where that number comes from. Also, if you look over here, you'll see that this black line, the thick black line is also sitting at about 2.25. So this is your visualization of the difference in those two EMAs. And that is highlighted here by the number. The PPO, the only difference between the two is that the PPO, you take this $2.25 and you divide it by that 26 day EMA, which is 5731, and you get this difference in moving averages in terms of percentages as opposed to dollars. So here you can see the PPO is 3.93. This is the math right here that you can do to come up with 3.93%. So that's the only difference. Look at the chart, look at the MACD and how it seems to run and look at the PPO. Essentially, they're the same. It's just one is expressed in dollars, the MACD, and the other is expressed in percentages. That's the PPO. All right, so very important because when you look at different stocks with different price points, if you try to compare the MACD, you can't really compare MACDs because Micron right now has a MACD of 2.25. I'm going to bring up a couple of charts. Well, first one being uh, Sirius XM Holdings. And look on this one, your 12 period and 26 period EMAs, the difference is 16 cents. So you look at this and you say, oh, serious, MACD is only 16 cents. But if I go back to Micron, it's $2.25. That means Micron's uh, more, you know, got more momentum. That, is, that would be an incorrect assumption uh, because you're looking at dollars. Micron's a much uh, higher dollar price stock. So, you know, you could have much a much bigger difference in terms of dollars, but you could have a smaller uh, PPO. Uh, in this case, Micron's PPO is 393, which is higher than uh, Siri. We go back to Siri and Siri's 2.31. But if I wanted to compare 
momentum of Sirius to the momentum of Micron, I would want to do it using the PPO, not the MACD. Because again, your MACD is going to be based on price. PPO is going to be based on percentage. It doesn't matter what the price of the stock is. And this is even further illustrated if we bring up another stock, Amazon. Because Amazon's PPO is 2.22, which is pretty close to Sirius and a little bit below Micron. But look at the MACD. MACD on Amazon's $36 because we're talking about a $1,700 stock. So again, your 12-day EMA is $36 above your 26-day EMA. But on a percentage basis, Amazon's strength, its momentum is actually less than both Sirius and Micron technology. So that's the thing to really understand about calculating the MACD and the, and the PPO. MACD is based on price difference of those two EMAs, and the PPO is based on percentage difference. So about six months ago, I'd been threatening for years to switch from the MACD to the PPO, and I still get a, a question once in a while why, why I switched. PPO is just better. And I had acknowledged that long ago when I was using the MACD, that the PPO is just the better indicator because you can compare multiple um, stocks, indices. Uh, if you want to compare momentum, the best way to do it is with the PPO because you are looking at percentages instead of the actual dollars. All right. So that was kind of I just wanted to make sure everybody has that base understanding of the difference between the MACD and the PPO. Now, all the other momentum oscillators, whether you're looking at the PMO or the RSI or stochastic, whatever you're looking at, all of them have different calculations. But MACD and PPO are very, very similar. Again, just the difference between whether you're looking at the difference in price of the two EMAs or difference in terms of percentage. So let's move on. Let's take a look at some of the things to think about when you're looking at the PPO. Now that we know the PPO and the MACD are about the same, and I gave you the reason why I think the PPO is better, all the rest of these charts I show you, I'm just going to use the PPO. If you looked at the MACD, you'd probably think you were looking at the exact same indicator. They really show very, very little difference. Next up, okay, so let's take a look at the negative uh, divergence here. First, I want you to look at the price here. Prices are rising, but if you just look at these two tops on the PPO, they're, they're lower. So anytime you have prices moving up, what normally happens in an uptrend is as you're rising, the 12 period EMA pulls away from the 26 period EMA and that results in a rising PPO. But when you get to a point where the, um, the rally is becoming very mature and you get a pullback and then you break to a new high, you can see a negative divergence develop. Many times you will see a negative divergence develop after a mature rally. That doesn't mean that you're going to see a huge sell-off. It doesn't mean that you're heading into a bear market because you have a negative divergence. It doesn't mean any of that. What it does mean is that your odds are beginning to increase, that you might get more of a pullback, more consolidation than what you have seen recently. So here you can see EC moving straight up, hardly any pullback little bit of a pullback here. We break out and right at the top there looks like maybe a dark cloud cover candle, reversing candle, negative divergence. That's generally a sign to me you want to be careful. Here EC pulls back. We get almost all the way back down to the 50 day. Notice the green arrows are showing we never went below the 20 day after we had set a new high. Prices move up. The PPO sets a new high. When it pulls back, I look for the 20 day to hold its support. And that's these green arrows right here. Then we break back out and eventually make another huge push up, put in the negative divergence, and then notice the 20 day doesn't hold. We go back down, we uh, essentially hit the 50 day, the PPO moves back down to the center line support area, and then another rally unfolds. So again, this negative divergence did not suggest that we were going into a bear market. It suggested that this major uptrend that we saw with 20 day EMA support holding simply went into a period of consolidation where the 20 day no longer did hold. And we, we went back to the 50, got the MACD back, or excuse me, PPO back to the center line. And then we started a new rally. And then eventually we put in a new high. We put in this lower price. We got a negative divergence. And once again, we go back to that 50 period. We go back to center line support. And now we're just simply consolidating here sideways on EC. Now I did mark here 
is this a negative divergence? Look at the dotted line coming across here. We got higher prices and we've got a lower PPO. By definition, that's a negative divergence. Higher price, lower PPO. I ignore it. It's one of the secrets for me. Um, I ignore it because this negative divergence, in my opinion, has already played out. When you go back to the center line, what that means is that your two moving averages, uh, and again, I always use the default 12 and 26 period EMAs. When you get a zero line test, it means that your 12 and 26 day EMAs are identical. There's no momentum in the market. So you've completely unwound whatever momentum you had previously, and now you're starting a new uptrend. I personally think that this is a mistake to go back and compare where it was before. It's just the way I look at the market. Let's keep moving. Um, now, this is one, this is another secret that I've talked about plenty of times on the show. But in this case, this was back in early May, so a little over a month ago, Fossil Group. Notice here we broke to a new closing high. And notice that the PPO was lower. So by definition, we have a negative divergence here, right? Higher prices, lower PPO, that's a negative divergence. But I want you to notice a couple things. Number one, you had a huge spike in volume. And I've talked about this many times. If I'm getting a breakout on massive volume, it's hard for me to argue that momentum is slowing. Yes, price momentum is slowing because it's a formula. So the PPO is just simply based on a formula. But I'm not blind. I can see that we're breaking out to a new high on very heavy volume. I don't see this necessarily as slowing momentum. The other thing is, and I've said this before, when you make a breakout, how far is this rally going to go? I don't know that it's going to stop right here. I mean, we got a nice breakout on heavy volume. I'm looking for, for further price appreciation to the upside. And if that occurs, then we could see this PPO really start to move up and the negative divergence get eliminated. And that's why when I first see a negative divergence, I don't act. Now, if I get a diver negative divergence and the volume is really light, that makes me a little nervous. If I get a reversing candle and I was in shorting mode, uh, then maybe I would short that particular security. But in this case, I'm getting a breakout with heavy volume. So what happened here after May 8th? Well, here was the negative divergence. Look what happened the next two days. If you had shorted just based on the MACD, or PPO, I'm sorry, in this case, or if you had shorted based on probably just about any momentum oscillator, um, it would have been a big mistake. And it's one of the reasons why I always talk about, for me, price and volume being my number one indicator. I'm getting a breakout here on heavy volume. I don't care what the PPO is telling me, to be honest. I've got a major breakout. Now, if I had a reversal, failed to hold the breakout level, and the volume was heavy on the reversal, and then I have a negative divergence, yeah, that could be a warning sign. But here we got a breakout. Notice what happened. Volume stayed very heavy, continued moving higher. What happened to that negative divergence? It's gone. Now, some might look at this, especially those who really don't follow technical analysis, and say, look at this. You said there was a negative divergence. It didn't work. Technical analysis doesn't work. Well, it worked perfectly here. We broke out on heavy volume. So negative divergence to me on the PPO is a secondary indicator. My primary indicator is bullish. Next up. All right, center line crossovers. You know, these can be very, very misleading. And what a center line crossover is, is when you're following the PPO or the MACD or the PMO or RSI, um, any of these different, in, well, not really RSI, unless you're looking at maybe 50 as being kind of a center line. But using the PPO, MACD, and the PMO, Anytime you cross from a negative reading to a positive reading, that's generally a bullish sign um, because when you're in negative territory, your short-term moving average is beneath your long-term moving average. When you cross, it, it flips, and now your short-term moving average becomes higher than your longer-term moving average. So it's short-term momentum is beginning to strengthen in the, in the particular stock. Now, RH, this was Restoration Hardware. This was back in 2016. But here's a stock that had been moving higher for about, I don't know, five, six weeks. And we got this positive crossover. But to me, it was not 
I mean, it was a bullish crossover. Anytime you cross over the center line, that's bullish. But it was it a buy. Would I buy that crossover? And my answer is absolutely no way. Um, first of all, there are a couple of warning signs here. We broke down on massive volume back at the end of February below prior price support around 47, 48. And notice as we came up here and we got this bullish crossover, did we ever take out price resistance? No. How about the latest breakout above this high? You see the PPOs rising. That means momentum's building, right? Where's the volume? You know, we're breaking out here to another high. It's a two month high. We got a strong PPO. Why is there no volume on the stock? Well, we're hitting a key area of price resistance. And again, to me, this can be a very misleading signal when you make a break above centerline resistance. Now, if we were getting a price breakout and at the same time the PPO is crossing, to me, that's a confirming signal to what price action is telling me. But when I get a breakout like this, a crossover that looks good, remember, this is just price action. It has nothing to do, and it's based solely on that uh, mathematical formula. So you want to really be careful if you read too much into that. I think uh, it can be a huge mistake here. We never took out price resistance. Volume did not support this move to the upside. We had a prior downtrend and we rolled right over. And if you got in on this move here on breaking above the center line, you probably would have gotten around 44, 45. It would have been a pretty ugly move down in the month of May. Um, hard to tell where you would put a stop in, but for me, I just that would not have been a buy signal. So just remember, PPOs, MACDs, whatever, in my view, they're secondary indicators. They can confirm great price action, but they also can give you very misleading signals from time to time. And I think this is a perfect example. All right, next up here is another uh, bullish crossover, right? And I'm giving you this one. This is in real time. This is today's action right here on snap uh snap looks good volume actually picking up so that is a maybe a little bit of a positive but we just got this center line crossover but when i look at this there's a major area of resistance we gapped down on over 150 million shares from about 1420 back in early may we are just now about to fill this gap i would not be surprised if snap were to roll over i wouldn't short it because i don't short in a bull market but I would not be buying it either up against major price resistance, even though the PPO is telling me that the price action is accelerating to the upside. Uh, I can still look at the chart and see that we haven't even gotten through gap resistance at this point. And that is major gap resistance based on that kind of selling. So snap, I just wanted to point out something in real time. We'll kind of watch this one going forward. Let's see if it breaks out. And by the way, there's no guarantee we're going to roll over and go lower, but I'm playing the odds. And I think that there are way better stocks uh, from a momentum perspective right now than Snap, even though in the short term, we did get a nice move. Once we got into this gap resistance area, we broke above the top of gap resistance. I think that did give us an opportunity and especially getting through the 20 day. I think I remember talking about this one a couple of weeks ago, not really liking it as it was testing this area. I wanted to see it get through the 20. It did get through the 20, but now it's got its overhead uh, gap resistance to deal with. So we'll see. Uh, another one that I wanted to give you an example. Here's a weekly chart on Bank of New York Mellon Corp, ticker symbol BK. Look at this slight bearish PPO centerline crossover that we came down. We went just below that centerline. And you might look at that. We've been above it for a couple of years. And so if that was your primary indicator, you would have said, I'm getting out or I'm going to short it. Look what happened. Right there is where it bottomed. But if you go back and you look, that was pretty key area of price support at $50. So I, again, this is an indication where price momentum is, appears to be accelerating to the downside, but we didn't lose price support. So price support, again, is going to be my number one uh, indicator. Acuity Brands, AYI. Uh, this is one from a... Um, line chart perspective that it, it's better to use a line chart. And I'm going to give you the example here. Now, this was action uh, back in February of this year. But if you look at a candlestick chart, in order to get a positive divergence, what you need is a lower price and a higher PPO. But if you look at this chart just based on the candlestick, you really don't see a lower price. 
at first glance, we're not, we don't have a lower price. Well, keep this in mind. PPO and the MACD are based on closing prices, not on intraday prices. So even if we saw a long move, you know, tail down here to the downside, that would not signify the lower price because we have to see lower closes. So here, where are our closes? You know, if you're not familiar with candlesticks, this could be a little confusing to see whether or not we have a lower close. Well, if you use a line chart, now look at it. You ha definitely have lower closes and you have higher PPO. So you do have a positive divergence and we did see at least a temporary move back to the upside before the overall downtrend continued. So if we go back to that candlestick chart, now if you know candles, you know that the bottom of a red filled candle is your close, which was at about the 145 level. And then here's the lower low close that we saw down at about 142. So if you're using a line chart, that's where we get the lower low. This hollow candle right here, you close at the upper end of a hollow candle. So the close was up closer to about 149. So that's why we see this lower close on a line chart. Again, there's your example. So if you're ever questioning on a candlestick chart whether or not you have a positive or negative divergence, I would suggest you pull up a line chart. It's much easier to see. It gets rid of all that noise, uh, the candlesticks themselves. It gets rid of all of the intraday action. And a line chart simply connects closing prices. So the line chart is a great tool when you're trying to decide uh, whether or not you have a positive or a negative divergence. Okay, uh, this is a kind of a something to keep in mind. When you have huge sell-offs in a stock, like Philip Morris had back in late April, you will see a huge spike, in this case, to the downside in the PPO. And notice how the PPO keeps improving here. It looks like price momentum is really looking good, right? I mean, wow, this is uh, some really nice action in the PPO. Price action kept going lower. This was not a signal that we were recovering on Philip Morris. This was a signal that this mathematical form. Quickly, the 26 day moving average takes longer. So as a result, the PPO took a big hit in the first week to 10 days of this move to the downside. And then by simple math, as you stay down here at this price longer and longer, that 26 day moving average starts to play catch up. And so you see a reversal in the PPO, even though price action is not reversing at all. It's one of the reasons why I don't like using the crossovers. And a lot of times I talk about a stock, if it's below the center line on the PPO is having negative momentum. That, you know, I think this, is, this helps to illustrate that point. When you're having a big sell-off, especially on very heavy volume and a quick, quick move like this to the downside, it's not at all unusual to see the PPO begin to rise, even though price does nothing back to the upside. And I kind of use a, a rule of thumb that the PPO, if it gets to 8 or 10%, either positive or negative, that's a level that you really want to be careful of because you almost always will see a positive or negative divergence develop after that. But I don't know that it's always telling us that we're, we have a reversal at hand. So you want to be careful. Now, if I go back and look at uh, Philip Morris, I'm going to stretch this out. And let's go uh, over the last five years. I'm just going to leave the daily chart up. First of all, ch check out the PPO here at minus six. And now let's go back five years. And let's take a look at where the PPO has been. And when you look back, on Philip Morris, the PPO has never been uh, lower than, you know, much lower than minus two. On the upside, it's never been above four. So when it got down to a minus six, that is an unusual level on Philip Morris. But the volume is telling us we want to get the heck out of Dodge. I mean, the volume, we break down below key support, volume is massive. That to me is a sign of significant distribution. So you want to be careful. Uh, when you see a, a PPO rising, it uh, doesn't always mean that you've got good price action. So that's just uh, another little tip that I wanted to point out in terms of the PPO. Okay, so I'm going to go ahead and uh, wrap this up. Let's go ahead and bring up the summary slide. 
Uh, just to give you a, an idea of some of the things we went over, there's a lot more I could cover with the MACD and PPO. I mean, literally, I could probably do a, a, a an all-day webinar talking about it and how to trade it with moving averages and so forth. But hopefully, this will give you a little bit better idea of what the MACD and the PPO are and how you can use it, some of, some of the limitations um, of both of these, and how you can use the PPO to compare between uh, key um, stocks, indices, and even using the PPO on, um, uh, what was it, uh, Philip Morris, the PM that I just showed you, being able to use the PPO, you could go back and look in prior times to see, okay, it's never been 6% below the zero line. That is very important. You can't do that with the MACD because the MACD is based on the price difference. So depending on what price action has done over the last five years, the, the MACD could go a lot higher or a lot lower because price action has gone a lot higher, or a lot lower because it's difference in price. So anyhow, uh, hopefully you enjoyed that. Uh, there you can see the different areas of the PPO and the MACD that we covered. And I think before we move on to the 10 and 10, why don't we bring up that poll? We were asking everyone which of the momentum oscillators or indicators that you prefer. And uh, pretty interesting stuff here. You got the MACD still the high at 27%. I, I'll admit, I was in that MACD camp and I loved the MACD. But I finally just said, you know what? The PPO is better. It's the same as the MACD. It's just better. It's just the new and improved model as far as I'm concerned than the MACD. But we do see the MACD 27%. PMO and RSI both 24%. PPO 18%. So a pretty tight race there. Yeah, I'm glad to see the PMO is is rating. That's very good because I, I do think it's better than the MACD and it's comparable to the PPO. It's just slightly different calculation. So very interesting. Somebody did ask, you know, why did the why is it a 12 and 26 day EMA when there's five trading dates in the week? And my answer, of course, was you'd, you'd have to ask Jared Appel, who who developed the MACD, why he chose those. But, um, and then the PPO, of course, uses it just to reflect the same information as the MACD. Yeah, and I, for me, it's about what other traders gonna do for technical analysis purposes. I mean, I'm trying to predict what price action is, what, what's gonna happen. And I, almost every indicator I use, I use default settings. So I'm gonna use the 12 and 26 day uh, EMA, I mean, you might be able to say, well, you know, I've got one, I got the five and the 17 that works perfect, or I've got the, you know, the, the 14 and the 22 that has worked really good for me in my trading. I don't understand the, the logic because if you're trying to predict what other traders are going to do and they're not using that same indicator, I'm not sure how it works. Mm -hmm. That's why I like the, to, to go with the default. And I do that whether I'm using the RSI, stochastic, PPO, MACD or whatever because I want to try to figure out ahead of time as we're getting close to key levels, what other traders are going to do. And if I'm using indicators that they're not using, it's really hard to predict uh, yes. using those, those indicators. So. Well, and, and yeah, the PMOs are different and I'm always asked about, you know, why we choose to use what we do and uh, whether the people should, can, do, should use that. And I always recommend the default just because again, we developed it in such a way that, those moving averages we think work better. So uh, recommend uh, you read about all of them really in chart school. All right, well, thanks for that. The Chart Watchers newsletter features expert technical commentary about the current market from some of the industry's leading technical analysts. See what's really happening in the markets through their eyes and gain an edge in your own investing. The newsletter is packed full of insightful and educational articles intended to help you become a better investor. Whether you are brand new to charting or a seasoned technical analyst, each edition will provide a wealth of informative content. It's the best way to stay informed on all the latest news, events, updates, and additions here at StockCharts.com. Whether it's a new feature or blog, an upcoming conference, or a special sale, you'll hear it first in the Chart Watchers newsletter. 